Uh, thanks, Nathan, for the introduction. I didn't know that you lived in Ulm. Also, <laughs> great to hear. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you like a small overview over the tequila package and some of its applications, which are mostly like rooted in quantum chemistry. Like similar like to other packages that you saw before, like in this hackathon, um, tequila is in principle like capable of doing almost all tasks. But of course, it has its like strong sides and like quantum chemistry is one of them. Um, I'm going to do a little experiment here. Um, so like in the talk, you will see a lot of code which you can, if you access my GitHub, you get like the same talk here in a Jupyter notebook. So like in principle, all of these code, like you can then like copy out and play with it yourself. Um, yeah, and if something shouldn't work um, or if you're unsatisfied with something, like feel free like to raise an issue there in the main repository of Tequila. And with this, um, Let's start directly, like what's the main design goal of Tequila? It's inspired by a quantum chemistry library called Madness. And it is um, meant for like rapid prototyping of new ideas in quantum algorithms um, with a focus on variational ones. But in principle, you could also do others. And we have some examples for this. And the idea is like that if you have like an idea for a new quantum algorithm and you would like meet up with your colleagues and scribble the equations on a blackboard um, that the code that you write actually looks similar to what you have on the blackboard. This gives you a lot of simplicity, but then of course there are also some drawbacks in terms of optimization. So like, I guess like the, the strong suit is that you can do simple demonstrations of like ideas and deploy them. Um, but maybe let's just jump in directly like with a first example. Um, like one of the main motivations of like quantum computers originally was like to simulate nature and the problem why it is challenging for classical computers is because in principle you often need uh, exponential memory in order to store these wave functions that you're interested in so like one quantum algorithm which is called a quantum phase estimation basically like mimics what you would do in a lab like let's say you have an atom or a quantum system prepared mostly if you want to analyze what's happening there um, you shine light on it maybe you can polarize it before and then it goes through a polarizer again and then you detect if something changed in the light or in other ways like you detect if there was interaction between the light and your like quantum probe and with this, like you draw conclusions about the nature of the wave function you were investigating. And of course, then you don't, you don't see the wave function, but you extract certain properties of it. Um, a quantum circuit, which basically mimics this process is like illustrated here as a small cartoon, like just assume your quantum state is already prepared. And then you can couple this with a second qubit, which you then measure and you like gain some information about the system. And you can do like a, a small example where like this interaction here is like given by a unitary which is controlled on this qubit and the unitary is generated by a Hermitian matrix and we're going to assume some properties here in order like to make the example a little bit easier but in principle that can be generalized and then you just need more qubits like if the eigenvalues are not zero and one you need more qubits to do like an n-bit approximation of a real number um so in principle, let's start with a like concrete example. Let's take like a small Hermitian matrix, which is just a poly X plus one. We do the plus one to fulfill this assumption here, like that the eigenvalues are zero and one. Um, in principle, you can initialize this with tequila as an abstract data type, which carries these poly information. So like in principle, that's not a full matrix. It's just an abstract collection of symbols. And, but if you want, you can, of course, like create the matrix, like feed it to NumPy, diagonalize it, and then also like feed the vectors into a wave function format to have like a nicer output, like to look how the eigenstates of this specific matrix actually look like. Now you can create this small circuit here. And again, you basically do what is done here. Like you just collect gates. Here's like one way to initialize such arbitrary unitaries, like you define the generator, which was this G that we defined before, like an Hermitian operator. You can in principle parameterize here, but here we take a static two pi angle for this example, and then we put the control on qubit zero. And 
what you get back is like an abstract circuit object and this you can simulate and then you get the wave function out. This is of course not like if you design like an actual quantum algorithm, so like you try to avoid working with the wave functions directly, but often it's like useful to be able to do that in order like to analyze on small examples what your circuit actually does. And the simulation here takes place by translating everything to a quantum backend and like giving you the data structure back. If you have not specified this, it will just look on your environment if you have some of those supported backends installed and like pick the, the fastest one for the task. Um, in principle, you can then also like directly emulate the measurement here. And this is also not like what one of the core features of Tequila is, but like in principle, you would explain it like to someone on a blackboard like this and say like, if we measure it here, like if we measure the qubit in state zero, how does the wave function on qubit one look? And you see here, if you measure this, like the wave function is actually exactly the eigenstate, one of the eigenstates before. So like in principle, what you did here is like you're measuring eigenstates and on the qubit register, the wave function will collapse into the eigen energy that you measured. Um, now those things are like promising approaches for like simulating physics and chemistry. And this was a toy model, but in principle, you do the same thing. Just like now your uh, emission matrix where you're interested in the eigenvalues is not like a, a two-dimensional matrix, but a very high dimensional one. So like, it means if you do the same algorithm, you will need a lot of qubits and a lot of gates, but the principle is the same. Um, and if you remember before, um, here we already assumed that some state is already initialized. In the circuit, we didn't do anything. So like in the simulation here, the state was also the zero state and we got lucky because the state has overlap with the eigenstates we were interested in. But um, depending on this overlap is also like your success probability of your quantum phase estimation. So this is one motivation for a variational quantum eigensolver where you try to train a circuit in order to give you like a reasonable approximation for the state you're after. So like in principle, these variational quantum eigensolvers don't need to have quantum advantage in the end, like because they can still provide like a useful result, which you can then use with a like long-term algorithm like quantum phase estimation. Just one small um, motivation for this. Um, but let's see how that would look if we do the variational quantum eigenserver on the same problem. Like we take this G as our Hamiltonian, like this is the, this is the object where we want the eigenvalue from and do like a small optimization. So like, here repeated like for convenience, the initialization of the operator that defines your measurements later. So the Hamiltonian of the variational quantum eigensolver. Then one single qubit rotation, which is like your ansatz and you can parameterize with an angle. If you give like any non-numeric type, uh, Tequila will interpret this as a variable, which you can then optimize later. Then you can form an abstract expectation value out of those two and start to minimize this. And you see like the minimization will yield you the ground state. And here you can like guess a little bit what's going on in the in the, in the the background. So like on my systems, I have the QLAX simulator like installed. This is why Tequila picked this to simulate this wave functions. Then we use BFGS as like the default optimizer if you don't specify it here um, that is used. Then like our objective is just a single expectation value and the gradient was compiled and it's two expectation values. What's happening in the back here is like that this shift rule is applied, which uh, Maria Schult talked about yesterday. Also for people maybe who like watch this talk uh, in the future, like the recordings, like there's a whole series like the day before from uh, Maria Schult, from Nathan and from Josh Isaac which you could rewatch and then you will learn a lot about the techniques that give you these gradients. And Tequila basically uses the same principles to get them. Um, we saw now that we could like minimize this expectation value, which is actually like an objective, like which is in Tequila, any sort of like combination or transformation of like multiple expectation values. If you like create those objectives, you can either simulate them or you can compile them to like abstract functions, which then means like the compiled objective you can use like an actual function. 
Um, and of course, you can also like use different backends, like do shop-based evaluation or like include uh, noise models. Um, further example, you could also then go beyond the ground state. Like now let's get also like the second eigen energy, which was just the one here. You can do this by overlap punishment. Um, this means like instead of just uh, minimizing the energy, you're also adding this term here, which punishes the overlap, which means you're looking for the minimum energy of a state that is orthogonal to the state you found before. And this is like a small piece of code that does this, like that uh, initializes this abstract objective. And of course, you can also like minimize this. Now we have two expectation values in like the objective and we find like the excited state. Um, of course, you can then also think about, in principle, you can do any sort of like weird combination you might want to do with this. So like here's a small example that you might like scribble on a blackboard. You say like, this is my Hamiltonian, which later like defines my measurements in the quantum run. This is my circuit and we have a C naught and like some gate, which is generalized, uh, generated, generated by this Y operation. And it's also parameterized in some way. Then we're taking the expectation value of this Hamiltonian with this circuit, but also add like the exponential of the gradient of this expectation value to the square, for example. And the code to initialize this in tequila looks exactly like this. And as you see below, like you can, for example, compile the gradient, but then also like combine it with those expectation values because like all of these data types are like the same abstract structure. It's just a collection of expectation values. In principle, then you can compile this to a function and like just evaluate it on different points and plot it and just like see what is this example actually. And it looks like this. Um, it has no like specific meaning. It's just an abstract example. But in principle, you could actually like uh, use this like to train optimizers because this is a single qubit example, but it's already like a non-trivial function. And like a simple BFG as optimizer might not be able like to find like the degenerate global minimum here. And for example, one thing, how this could work is like use a Bayesian optimization um, where we also support some. I had an example here, I fortunately took it out, but like it's on GitHub. It's just, I think during Marco's talk, someone asked exactly that question, like, can you also do Bayesian optimization? And then you can basically do this. Um, or you could do this like half, then use the best point from the Bayesian optimization, use this as initial uh, point for like a BFGS optimization. Um, of course, you can go further and this is something, um, if you wanna play with it, it's fine, but I wouldn't do it on a larger scale. Um, use like this abstract function, which has these like quantum objectives in it and if, and use this as like the parameter for a second quantum circuit with a different Hamiltonian. Um, I think I overdid it here a little bit with the realism on the blackboards. Like it's a bit hard to read. Um, those two are like sigma plus and sigma minus. So like the qubit raising and lowering operations. So like this thing is basically a qubit excitation, which you can also like use some like predefined gate set to do this. If you do this, like the gradients get a little bit cheaper, but in principle, you can also initialize it over the generator again. And then you can do the same thing, like evaluate this function and now it looks like this. So like as a potential training example for like an optimizer, it's even harder now. Um, but it's just an abstract example. And in principle, this is a sort of a, a quantum network. Um, and you can play around with these things in Tequila, but like creating a whole network like this, I would not recommend. Then it's like better to use Penny Lane, which is much better at this task. Um, Here's like an actual research example, which is called uh, Meta VQE. And the uh, brain behind it is like Alba Severa Liata, who is also speaking uh, tomorrow and maybe also a little bit about this. And I'm giving you like, a, again, like a one qubit example, how you can do your own. So like what's happening here is that your Hamiltonian is parameterized also by some variable C. And what you're trying to do is um, you're trying to learn the relation of this parameter with respect to the parameter that parameterizes your circuit. In that case, just a single gate here. And what you can then do is uh, formalize this again in Tequila, like this is the code that does it, um, and start to train this. So like you pick like certain training points, 
which parameterize your meta variable, which I called here X instead of C, I'm sorry. And then sum up all these expectation values, have like a larger objective and like optimize this. You can optimize this, find the minimum, and then you can test it by like doing all sorts of points, um, evaluating those angles, evaluating like the, the true minimum of your objective and like just compare it. And in that case, it would be these are like the predicted angles and the optimized ones. And of course the predicted angles here are linear because in uh, this specific case, we use the linear parameterization for like this meta angle. But of course you can also do like different ones. You see like the optimal one is not not completely linear. So like in principle, you can do the same thing and do like a quadratic fit basically in this very simple example. And then you you get it like perfectly. And of course, this is not what uh, Alba did in the paper, but this is like a very, like the, the simplest example you can think about like to illustrate this. Um, but like if you're able to do this, you're also able like to do it with more complicated things because it's basically just changing the Hamiltonian and the circuit in this like code example before. Okay. Um, now let's get to the main point, like for quantum chemistry. I'm, like it's going to be the same as before like i'm going to show like some examples and like hopefully they're a little bit related to the one qubit examples uh, we did before in order that it maybe becomes more accessible um but let's see so like if you want to do quantum chemistry like in principle what you need is like the hamiltonian which describes your molecule you're interested in uh in the language of the qubits you have access to and there are different ways of doing this. Um, and we're supporting two uh, main quantum chemistry backends. One is like Psi4, uh, which uses classical basis set representation and one which is basis set free, which is called madness. And like where the implementation is also a little bit more experimental. And we're currently working on making it uh, more accessible, but I'm trying to show you like a little bit how to use that. Let's start with a simple task, like get a molecular Hamiltonian and qubit representation. What you can do if you have Psi4 installed, you define like how your molecule looks like by just giving the coordinates either like this or by giving a file where they're in. Then you, def then you have to give something that is called basis set, which is a collection of predefined functions. I'm going to have a little bit more details about this in a second. But in principle, if you have Initialize, initialize this, you can get like the Hamiltonian from this on the qubits, like in the qubit language. So like this will give you back again, like just a collection of these abstract poly operations. Uh, same format as we saw before. Um, of course you can print it out and you can see like that they're actually quite large. So like I would not recommend printing the Hamiltonians for larger molecules, they, they really get massive. Um, if you're a bit familiar with quantum chemistry, like there's this thing called Hartree Fock, which is basically what is used to create the molecular orbitals from the basis set. Um, and since this classical pre-computation was already done, it usually makes sense like to initialize all your circuits in the Hartree Fock state. But depending on which qubit mapping you are like using, like these circuits will look different. So like there's like this convenience function which just says prepare reference. This gives you back the circuit, which gives you the Hartree Fock state. You can then also make an abstract expectation value, evaluate the Hartree Fock energy, um, check a little bit what this thing is. Like it has one expectation value again, like it has 15 measurements. Where do the 15 measurements come from? They come exactly like from the 15 terms in this Hamiltonian. Then maybe you want to run an experiment or do like some shot based estimations and then 15 measurements are maybe already like too much or like it becomes unfeasible. So in principle, when you, when you initialize your expectation value, you can also optimize your measurements. And I'm not going to go into the details what's happening here. Like the implementation was done by TC Yen and Vlad of uh, the group of Arthur Ismailov on the University of Toronto. And they have a whole series of papers how to optimize those measurements. Um, but what's happening in the back now, now you see we have two unique expectation values, but only two measurements because these expectation values only have like poly Z operations and you can evaluate them all in parallel on a quantum computer. And this is basically uh, what Tequila manages for you. So like you can use those things, but you don't need to be an expert in them. Of course, it also is like, it's always good like to know at least roughly what's going on. 
Um, just a different example, like lithium hydride molecule. This time we use the bravi kitai mapping. If you don't specify which qubit transformation you want to use, it will always use Jordan Wigner in the back. It's also then printed here if you print the molecule. And you see also, um, we also have information about the irreducible representations of the point group of the molecule. And now it's again, like if you're like familiar with those terms, you can use this information now to make like your circuits more efficient or your algorithms. If you don't know what this is, you can just ignore it and think about it as like abstract labels for orbitals. But in principle, this information is here. And what you can also do is like, you can make a so-called active space, which when which means you say um, for my qubit Hamiltonian, I don't wanna use all the orbitals here, but just like a subset of them. Let's just say you wanna use these two orbitals here. And then you can do this by just saying, I want to use the first two or like the second and the third orbital of the A1 irreducible representation, give this to tequila and the rest then works exactly the same. And like this management of the active space is done for you. Uh, now let's go a little bit beyond Hartree Fock. You could now try to like solve this active space lithium hybrid molecule and construct like a manual circuit. Here's like a small example. This is how it looks. Um, now you optimize it again in the same way. You take the Hamiltonian and the circuit where you also like put this Hartree Fox state before, and then you minimize everything. In principle, since this is a very small like molecule, um, you can explicitly create the matrix of this Hamiltonian and brute force diagonalize with NumPy. You can also use the full CI module of Psi4 in order to get like the same energy basically. Um, and you see here, you get the same energies back because this is a very simple model and our like manually constructed ansatz is able like to capture the ground state. What you see here is like the full CI energy of Psi4 gives you the same thing back, which means like here, the same active space was like initialized by Tequila. Like it kind of keeps track of that for you that it's um, that it stays consistent or at least in most cases. Um, Going beyond manually crafted circuits, you can refer to something that uh, Patrick Coles, for example, yesterday in his talk, referred to as physically inspired circuit construction. And this is one of the examples which does this, which is called unitary coupled cluster or UCC. And with this, you construct like primitives in your circuits in the fermionic uh, representation. Like you take fermionic excitation and annihilation operators and create generators for fermionic excitations. And you can map all of this down to the qubit level and create gates from it. And this is also like then some of the things that are like automatized. But what's the advantage here? What's the physical inspiration? Um, the physical inspiration is like that circuits constructed with those generators like operate in a specific subspace of the full Hilbert space, which we already know that our target state is in. In that case, like it, for example, it keeps the total number of electrons in your state constant. Like you cannot lose or gain an electron if you evolve your circuit like this. Um, small example how that works in Tequila, like you can just make these excitation generators here. And it will not give you back the fermionic ones, but it give you back the fermionic ones already mapped to the qubit, depending on which transformation you choose before. If you haven't chosen anything, then it's Jordan Wittner. And here that would be electron excitation from spin orbital zero to two and vice versa and one and three at the same time. So like it's a double excitation. Then you can create a gate in the same way as in the one qubit example in the very beginning with this generator, uh, parameterize it, create the full circuit, and uh, start to optimize it. Then it looks like this. Um, you can also draw the circuit in a very abstract way here. Um, the way it's drawn here is like these parts here like represent the generators which go into your exponential. Um, now you reach the same energy and you see like already in the small example, now all of a sudden you just take three iterations instead of like, I don't know how many it was before, but it was more than three. So like it already converges better. But you probably also see like now your gradient cost is like 16 expectation values instead of just two. And where it comes from is like that this gradient compilation needs to treat all of these eight individual blocks, which the fermionic excitation decomposed to individually. And each of them needs two evaluations. So like two times eight is 16. And this is this factor of 16 here. But you can, of course, save 
on the gradient information by like exploiting the information that all of these resulted from the same fermionic excitation. And Tequila can do this for you. And here's like just a slight overview how it works. So like in general, if you use an N, if you use an unitary couple cluster operation that excites N fermions or N electrons, you, you need two to the power of two N evaluations later for the gradient if you do the compilation on the qubit level. But if you do it exact already on the fermionic level, you can save that down to a constant factor of four, or in the case of real wave functions, to a constant factor of two. And the way that it works is basically what we wanted to do was doing the shift rule directly in the fermionic algebra. The problem is that these operators don't have all the necessary properties that are needed in order like to apply the shift rule. But there's a lot of structure in that formulation which gets lost once you like compile it down to the qubits and you can exploit those structure and like properties of the operators in order to get something that looks similar to the shift rule. It's basically you're doing the shift rule and then you're doing some additional gates in order to undo the damage. And if you just want to use it, you can ignore all of this information and just like use it in Tequila by instead of like creating the generator and compiling it down to qubits where you lose this information, you just make an excitation gate, which basically follows the same syntax and gives you back the same gate. It's just now when Tequila does the gradients, it knows this is a fermionic excitation and can exploit these properties. In the same way, it works for these qubit excitations, which we saw uh, before in the one-dimensional examples. Um, then minimization looks exactly the same, just like that your gradient is now a factor of two instead of a factor of 16. Um, now at the last point, um, I'm, quick, I'm trying to quickly go over this. Uh, we saw um, before when we initialized the molecule, you had to specify a basis set. And what these basis sets are, these are like collections of functions that are placed on the atoms in order to represent your molecular orbitals later. So like this is the underlying numerical representation. In principle, you can use any set of orthonormal one-body functions, which just means orthonormal three-dimensional functions in order to represent your Hamiltonian. And you're almost always like protected by the variational principle, but of course not in the other direction. So. You want something that is fairly compact, but also has like a good uh, numerical representation. The standard approach are these basis set, which just means you need, you take a predefined set of functions and they will always look the same. So like, for example, here in this methane, the functions which go on the carbon atom are exactly the same as the functions that go on the carbon atom in a protein or like in a double bonded uh, molecule whatsoever. They never change, like it's predefined. And then you compute your qubit Hamiltonian, and then you try to find the ground state of this thing. Um, one issue here, like despite the fact that it's like very well developed classically, um, not necessarily all advantages can be directly translated to the quantum machinery. So like a lot of advantages you might lose. Um, then another drawback is like you have an unknown numerical error. Like this is a predefined basis set. If you use it on this molecule, you have no way of like determining how large your numerical error is that you made by like using the spaces set instead of like something that represents the whole space. Um, in general, if you want accurate results, you need large basis sets, which means you will need a lot, lot of qubits like later. So like for a lot of classical um, algorithms, it's not so drastic if you need more orbitals. For quantum algorithms, it is because it means you need more qubits. And also, like if you think about it from a user perspective, um, it requires a high level of expertise to use them because you really need to know like which basis set can I pick for which property and which molecule. And since there's not a textbook answer and the numerical error is in principle unknown, the only way of getting this expertise is like by having a lot of experience. Um, now you could think like, can there be like an alternative where we don't use this predefined basis set, but like optimize something directly for the molecule of interest? And of course you can do this. Um, and what you then get back is something that comes closer to the thing that you actually want, um, which is you have a molecule, you have an algorithm, you get back an accurate energy, at least something you can interpret. 
reality looks currently like this. You have to pick from a zoo of acronyms and like the bigger zoo is actually like these basis sets. And if you're not familiar with quantum chemistry, you can probably like estimate already that it gets like quite challenging to pick the, the right one here to get like an accurate energy and especially like to verify it. So here's like one example, like with this, this basis set here, which is actually considered a small one in classical algorithms, but here the same molecule that we used before, like the last one was lithium hydride, um, would cost you 38 qubits already. Um, and the alternative is like using a flexible representation and nothing predefined and constructing system adapted orbitals, which are like optimized for the molecule you're interested in. And the way we're doing is like, we're taking a surrogate potential because we cannot solve the full problem because then there's nothing left to solve on the quantum computer. And also it's of course intractable, but the hope is that the surrogate potential captures already like a lot of the essential physics of this molecule. So like that you get back system adaptive orbitals, which are kind of optimal for the process you want to use them. Um, it has the advantage that's like now the limitations are defined by the surrogate model and they are physically interpretable. Also, like you have a natural order on those orbitals. So like now you can clearly say which ones are like expected to be more important and which ones are expected to be less important. And that might be interesting, like for people who are interested in machine learning approaches, like to have this sort of structure on your Hamiltonians. And another advantage is then that, uh, what you get back is like very compact. And here's like just a, a rough overview. Like we computed some molecular systems, like use different energy metrics and like looked how many qubits of this like system adaptive, like when is the energy the same, like accuracy wise for the system adapted and the traditional ones. And you can save a lot of qubits here. Like for example, lithium before you saw this one basis set was like 83 uh, qubits, but you can get the same accuracy with 12 to 22 instead of 83 to 88. So it means a lot of things become feasible that were unfeasible before on current hardware. Um, small information like that you can check like in the notebook on like more information about this and like more details and here like a small crash course how to use it. Of course, you need to install uh, this madness library, which is not from me, but uh, from a lot of people. And the main person behind it is uh, Robert Harrison. If this works, you can use this as a quantum backend for Tequila and get these system adapted Hamiltonians. And then the rest works exactly the same way as before. And here in this example, this is like one specific ansatz that we constructed in that paper that already like exploits uh, information from the surrogate model also like to decrease the number of parameters. It's so like, here's a small uh, uh, example on like a lithium hydride. This is like a 12 qubit representation of lithium hydride. And you see, you basically then just need four parameters, which is fairly compact. Um, the circuits are of course uh, still like quite large, but there are ways like to reduce them. Um, but it's, uh, it's currently in the making, but um, maybe stay tuned for the next months. Um, could probably like reduce them further. Uh, some other examples which you can do with this are, for example, adaptive solvers. I don't want to go into too much detail here, like where you construct your circuit adaptively or like a more generalized version that we developed. Here's a little bit how that code would look like. This is a small application for Tequila. And if you're interested in like doing your own, it, it kind of makes sense like to look at this application and see like how this uses like the different primitives of tequila and maybe this gives you some sort of inspiration. You can also do a meta VQE with molecules. This looks exactly the same as our one dimensional example in the very beginning, like just the different encoding here. And you can also play with this, of course. You can do the same like training steps and evaluation steps and then see like which angle was predicted and which angle is actually the optimal one. And for this small example, you're doing quite well. You could, for example, think about playing with it, like replacing this representation with a sigmoidal function, which should also be able like to capture that very well, or like try like another molecule. Like in the paper we did H4, you can, for example, try this. Another suggestion, if you want to use these Hamiltonians for machine learning, um, since I already suggested that, um, you might want to use it in penny lane because maybe you have already like uh, some code there to construct 
for example, like a quantum network where you think that this can like predict properties of the Hamiltonians pretty well um, and you want to try it out. This is a little bit how it would work. Like you can use open fermion like as bridging code basically and then read in these Hamiltonians in Penny Lane and use your own codes for it. Just like a small suggestion for the hackathon. I think it doesn't help you with the tasks, but uh, who knows what you're planning after this. Uh, last but not least, um, um, of course, I'm not doing everything alone, like especially Tequila has a lot of like contributors from like different groups. Uh, one who really sticks out here is uh, Sumner Alperin Lee, which is a grad student at Alan's group. And then we have Philip and Tera, who did like great work on the basis set free VQEs and Avinav for the gradient implementation for unitary couple cluster. Um, with this, um, at the end of my talk, I think I went a little bit over time. I hope it's still fine. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Jacob, for the very interesting talk. Uh, one thing I did actually want to question really quickly, what's what's with that photo of Alan in the that last slide there? Where, where is he standing? Oh, it's in Toronto. It's somewhere downtown. Um, I think it's close to where he lives. So like somewhere around campus. But I also yeah. don't know exactly which I don't I think it's not Graffiti Alley. I think it looks it's different. Okay, so he's got a, a separate, for those who don't know, there's a graffiti alley in Toronto. It's not that close to U of T, so there must be another one that he's standing in front of there. He, he told us once, but I forgot. I to... <laughs> cool. Um, so actually, for all the people out there, Jacob was a participant at the last QHack uh, in 2019. I remember uh, you guys had a team, and I remember coming to you and telling you, we, you, know, you need to practice your, your pitch for your final presentation and you guys look so stressed i just remember that moment you're like no i don't want, i don't want to hear from you right now we just want to finish our hackathon project so i imagine a lot of people are going through that same situation over the next few days and our qml challenges and they might have the same experience next week as they're doing their open hackathon projects do you have any advice for for you know as a seasoned hackathon participant a quantum hackathon expert yeah don't pick uh two large tasks like uh try with something uh, like start with something simple like think about something simple and then do something even simpler, like to get started. Then because you don't have so much time, actually, it's just a week. Perfect advice. Also good advice for uh, would be software library developers out there as well, wouldn't you say? Yeah, probably general in life. <laughs> start, start small. I think uh, in English, we have this expression, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. So it's, it's, it's obviously a common, common piece of advice. Let's look at the, the questions from the chat here. We got a few questions already. Uh, keep them coming in. I'll throw them up as I see them for, for Jacob here. So we had a couple questions about um, Tequila itself. So the software library Tequila. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and ask it right away. Why would you use Tequila over other Python libraries? Like for instance, Penny Lane, some users are curious. It's super hard to answer actually, because it's um, it depends on your own style and preferences, but there's some explicit examples. Like for example, if you're interested in a specific paper and this has already an implementation in Penny Lane and you have an idea for extending this, then of course you're using what is already there in order to build up. But sometimes if you wanna learn more about it, it makes sense like to re-implement everything in a different package because then you automatically do it in another way because it has a different API and everything. And then you have more like diversity in the end. Um, so it really depends on the people um, and always like also what's already there in those packages. So like for Tequila, I would say like the, the strong side of it is currently quantum chemistry applications. Um, so when I can recommend this is if you're like interested in unitary coupled cluster, like having some idea like how to assemble these uh, operators do like an adaptive solver or things like this. And of course, like if you're interested in these basis set free approaches. Um, but it can also be like quite, uh, you can also learn a lot like from trying like to re-implement this in another package. So like it always depends on what you want to do with it. It's a very, very diplomatic answer. Yeah, it's like, it's my honest belief. So uh, again, with Tequila, there's, um, I know I've seen it in your documentation. I've seen it in your talks before. 
you always go with this blackboard style. You say there's this blackboard format, and, and people were calling that out in the chat as well because they're saying, you know, it's it's kind of interesting that to add a, a quantum circuit, you actually do a little plus sign to, to add your, your gate and operation to the circuit. So what is behind this philosophy of this blackboard style? Um, it comes actually like, uh, for example, this uh, madness library that I showed, which we use like as a qu uh, quantum chemistry backend, this has a similar API, like it uses this multi-resolution representation of abstract functions, but on the very top, you actually just see the functions, which makes you like, for example, if you write like a small optimization algorithm there, you just say like, this is how my greens function look. And then we need to apply this to this. And the, the, uh, the potential is like the inner product of this multiplied to this function. And if you then write the code, it looks exactly like this, which makes it super readable. And also if someone, if you, for example, doing a small example to illustrate something, you can send this to someone and it's like then easy for this person to read. It's not necessarily then super optimized, but it's like a clear way of communicating like fresh ideas, so to say. If you mm -hmm. want to do like something really large scale, then that's probably then a drawback because uh, then you're like sacrificing a lot of like, uh, potential things to optimize because everything needs to stay generalized. Um, and the idea was like, because we really had this a lot, like you, you meet like in the seminar room, like people have ideas or you discuss a paper and then you say like, oh yeah, but in principle, if we take that circuit and add like this layer, um, this should make it like better. Or like if we add this thing to the objective function, like punish, like for example, specific states, that should like elevate the problem or like let's try out optimizing the gradient directly instead of using it in an optimizer and those things. Um, and then usually um, a lot of times, like you need to demonstrate this first, like on a small system in order, like also to convince yourself that it's a good idea. And then a lot of times it's also like a bad idea. And then you realize it, that it doesn't work. But if you have like a way of like doing this very fast and that, the code that you write more or less looks like the original idea you had, and you're just trying it out on a one-dimensional, two-dimensional example and see what comes out. Um, and then if it works, you can like then send it to your colleagues and say, this is basically what we discussed last time. And then they remember it from the code yeah. instead of if you have like 500 files and like a, a whole library, which is then probably faster, but, um, then it's harder to communicate. Cool. At, at Zenida, we, we, we do quantum software, uh, but it's, it's very tightly coupled to our research as well. We often think of it as software-driven research. So the software, having something implemented in a nice way actually gives us new ideas because it's, it's a clean interface. So how, how does you know this Blackboard style of tequila actually dovetail with your, your research in your group? Um... Are you getting ideas from tequila, from the, you know, uh, something that you learned uh, in, in, or you, you kind of, in solving a coding problem, you end up with a solution, which then you can think of, does this generalize? Can I apply this to other systems? Can I do publish a research paper on this? And in particular, I want to call out the, um, the great paper you guys had about the fermionic gradients, you know, recognizing that essentially, if you just do the software straightforwardly, uh, doing this parameter shift rule, you end up with many, many, many gates. But if you're smart, you can actually get uh, a new software feature and a new paper out of the same idea. Yeah, this actually is, it's a very good example because this is more or less what happened. Like um, we had like our framework on unitary coupled cluster and then we were trying out some ideas, like for example, um, screening, like doing these adaptive solvers. And then one thing was like that we realized it's like harder to do for excited states because then you can't do this commutator trick because the operator you add is not on the trailing end. So like we thought, but now we have, we can do it with the shift rule and evaluate the gradient like this. And then we realized it becomes like super expensive also in the optimization. And then one of the first ideas was actually just change the generator in order to be directly differentiable by the shift rule. And like a prototype for this was basically done then in the same day, because it's just at the top level of the code, you're like just subtracting parts away from the generator and then it works. And then you can directly start playing with it. And then we realized like it works basically, but then for a lot of cases, like the larger your circuit grows, um, the gradients are then more 
like are not as expensive anymore, but like this modified generator starts to introduce phase factors between your different configurations, which you actually don't want there. And then you spend a lot of time in the optimization to get rid of those phase factors again. And then we started to analyze this. Why does this problem not happen in the very beginning? And why does it come up later? And this is like where we basically figured that out that like, if like the so-called null space of this generator is not occupied, then this thing that we did was actually exact. And from this, like we figured out at some point that we don't need to approximate the generator. And like at some point, then you get deeper and deeper and like you also figure out numerically that like you can do some approximations and then after analysis, like you realize for real wave functions, this always holds true. But it was, it was really like a uh, code guided basically like playing around with the code and then thinking about how to make it faster. It's, it's almost as if, um, you know, you mentioned this blackboard style, but having a blackboard style code lets you think both in the coders mindset, but also in the, you know, the equation, the theorist mindset. So it allows you to kind of see things from different perspectives that you wouldn't have if you didn't have the software available to you. Yes. It's so like, it, for me, like I realized this, for example, I almost never think about measurements. Because for me, this is all abstracted away in the Hamiltonian. But I realize a lot of people, like for example, in QML, they think a lot about measurements, like it's then a different way of thinking. So like it, it makes some things easier, but sometimes it also introduces a bias a little bit. Mm -hmm. but this is also then why it's important like to have like these different styles. Like if you then do like the same algorithm in another package, because this uses diff has a different API, like has different structures. The algorithm looks different there, and you maybe get new ideas from this. Cool. My next question, I think I already know the answer to it, but where does the name of the software library come from? Oh, um, there was Alan's idea, of course. Um, and I think the original story behind this is that uh, I think it was back in Berkeley when he did like his first works on uh, quantum. Uh, one of his codes was named Tequila. And it was basically the, this is now like a lot of back. like, yeah, the, the legacy. Yeah, that's it's pretty much, pretty much the answer I was expecting. Cool. We've got a few questions from the chat, maybe a bit more technical questions. I'll try to summarize here. A few people asking about Hamiltonians. So A, are the Hamiltonians that you're seeing in these problems they might tackle with tequila or in quantum computing more generally, are those the same complexity as you might see in classical molecular simulations or are they different? And can you also, I'm kind of putting a few questions here together. So are they the same complexity or not? Um, and can you also uh, parameterize your Hamiltonians in addition to parameterizing your circuit? Um... I start with the second one because it's easier. Um, currently, like you can parameterize the Hamiltonian directly, but in principle, since your Hamiltonian is like a lot of those poly strings, you can all wrap them in like a different expectation value and those you can parameterize. Like you can write, for example, parameter times expectation value, which gives you an objective back, but not in the Hamiltonian itself. Because this is, the reason for this is just because we're currently using open fermion to represent those Hamiltonians and there you cannot parameterize it. But mm -hmm. with a small trick, you can of course do it. Um, and the second question, I'm not sure if I, if I got it correctly. So like for, for quantum chemistry, if you have like the second quantized Hamiltonians, like of course they're like subjected to like a basis that you chose before, but no matter what you chose, like then you get like this discretized Hamiltonian back. And if you map that to the qubits, like for example, with the Jordan Wigner transformation, that's the same thing, basically. It's just like in, it's now expressed with different operators, but the, it's, it's isomorphic. So like the, the operators have the same spectrum. And if you would form like the matrix out of them, which is, then it's basically the same. Um, there are other like mappings, like for example, these tapered Bravi Kitaev, where you like exploit some symmetries or like in other hands, like you don't, you, you fix some symmetries in your ground state and this will also reduce your Hamiltonian. So like then it's not the same anymore and the complexity is already like a little bit um, reduced because now you're like, you're restricting some, some parts of the Hilbert space. But like for the standard mappings, you can think about it as the same object. It's a, 
it's a technical thing because you need to translate that object to qubits. Got it. And what is what is the next phase of development for Kila? How can people contribute? Um, I mean, in general, it's like it's open source code, code, um, and it's academic. So like, um, you can you can go to GitHub, make a fork, uh, do with it whatever you want, and if you think it should be added to the main repository, just make a pull request. So like, it's totally open for everyone like to to try around and also to extend it. Um, sometimes like if you have like big plans for something, maybe it's sometimes it's like makes sense to contact us before, like just to prevent that like a lot of people are working on the same things. Um, and there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things like to discover. It's also, it always like makes sense like to re-implement something that is there in another package, but like not trying to copy it, but like trying to like do your own implementation. Um, it's just then you like, you provide something for others that might can use it and you can learn a lot about like how these things work. Um, but yeah, totally open, like whoever wants to contribute. It's interesting you mentioned uh, open source because quantum open source didn't really exist, say, you know, when I was a student or when you was a were a student, how can you, how can you see that things have changed or what kind of benefits do you see now that uh, you would have wished to have when you were a student? Oh, it's like, um, I mean, since I have like this quantum chemistry background where a lot of code is, is not open source, there is often really like, if you want to use some specific things, you have to be part of some group. Otherwise you don't have like access to it. it it's getting better. Like, um, we have pi SCF or like Sci4 and like also like more open source packages are coming up. Like. I'm, I'm aware of those, but for the quantum things, it was like really great. Like when I entered that area that you don't have to build everything from scratch. I mean, we kind of ended up doing this, but like, if you're like just interested in doing something like there's already, there's also so much like tutorials online, like the penny lane tutorials alone, there are like, uh, it's basically like a small lecture series and like, for people who are interested in that field is like super useful. Also like they look quite great. So like for me, it's often like um, if I'm interested in something like then I can also go to those tutorials and look at all of this and nothing like this was there like before. And a lot of times it's often that a lot of this knowledge is just like internally preserved, but it's not out there in a like accessible manner. And I think that also really accelerates the whole field. Yeah, I'm super, super happy to hear that because, you know, that's that's kind of my picture as well, is that by opening things up, it really makes it much more accessible to everyone. So uh, it's great that, you know, we, we have these libraries that are out there now that people can, it's not closed off. People can, if they want to learn, they can learn. It's there. It's just a matter of putting in the time and the resources are great. So why don't we switch now just to finish up here from, from serious discussion to a bit more silly discussion. So, uh, we have, uh, we, we kind of chatted to all our speakers before the the actual QHack event because we wanted to get a little bit of a personal touch. And I must say that your, your, your kind of answers to our, our quiz questions earlier in our in our interaction were a bit funny. I thought, you, you know, I asked a few, a few things and it always kind of, kind of came back to like fast food, chocolates, Coke and, and so forth. So. Uh, I know our, our Xanadu CEO, Christian Weebrook, he's a big fan of Diet Coke as well. So he'll love, he'll love to hear about this. But what is, what is the story there, this, this obsession with, with Coke? Oh, I just really like it. Like also like not just uh, almost all brands, like just this type of soda pop. Like since I was a kid, it was awesome. <laughs> you know? I, hear, I, hear, I even have it for breakfast some days. Yeah, yeah. So like, it's also like one of the COVID effects because there's not so much you can do currently. And one of my activities is just to go outside and like go to the convenience store. And then of course, then I, I buy these, the small pops. And like, then often this is one of the first things I do in the morning. And then, yeah, I get, my wife doesn't like it so much. Like she says it's unhealthy. Can't, I can't imagine why she would say that. That's no idea. All right, cool. So, so to finish off, well, why don't we play uh, a little game here? I played this with an earlier speaker as well. So the game here is called Real or Imaginary. 
So I'm going to give you a phrase or a word, and you have to tell me whether it's real, which means that it's something that's from the quantum community. It's something that actually exists in the quantum literature, or it's imaginary. It's just something that I'm trying to trick you with. Okay. Okay. So maybe maybe I start. Uh, I'll try to find some easy ones here to start off. So you. So how about quantum circuit born machine? Real or imaginary? Quantum born machine is real. So like, I guess the quantum circuit born machine is also real. That's right. It is. It is real. It's a, a generative model based on quantum circuit probabilities. All right. Relative entropy of magic. Oh, that's tough. Um, I mean, there are the magic states and the magic state distillation. And I could imagine someone came up with it, but I've never seen it. So like, I would say imaginary. This one is actually real. It's real? Yeah, it's it's an actual uh, quantifier, quantum correlations quantifier that is proposed in some papers from about 10 years ago. So it is real. All right. How about um, quantum coffee? There is a quantum chemistry library which is called quantum espresso. I'm not sure if this counts. So. Well, it's close, but uh, what, what do you think about quantum coffee? Um, uh, hard to say. I would say imaginary. That's right. So um, quantum coffee is actually a coffee shop in Toronto. That's near Xanadu's old offices. Oh, where is it? Know? It's on uh, Spadina Avenue. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know it. Okay. But like, I completely like, I didn't make the connection. All right. XZ calculus. Uh, that's real. That's real. Can you explain it? Do you know what it is? Uh, we have actually like a tequila plug-in for the Pi XZ library. Like it was one of the quantum open uh, source foundation mentees. Like uh, her name is Claudia Zendeja Morales. Um, maybe she's in the chat. She can explain it better than me, but it's like an abstract calculus, like which I would say like, represents quantum circuits in a very abstract way where you can a lot of things are like merged together and it's very graphical but i haven't like you can probably uh guess already i haven't used it so much myself but you, you recognize it enough to pass the, the the test there apparently there's a nice textbook about it great uh we're running uh at the end of our hour here so jacob i really want to thank you for coming to talk to us today lots of great questions in the chat lots of great answers we will just quickly say goodbye to Jacob and then we will go to our scoreboard system. So Jacob, thanks very much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It was really awesome.